Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the next installment of the CRISP speaker series on privacy. Uh, it's our pleasure to have Dr. Joseph Bonneau. Uh, Dr. Bonneau uh, received his PhD uh, from Cambridge University in 2012 and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton. And he will be talking to us today about putting strong uh, secrets in human memory. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, right, so uh, this was joint work with Stuart. Uh, Stuart Schechter at Microsoft Research. The paper will be at Usenix. Um, Stuart, of course, uh, being the usability person who did uh, most of the hard work here, um, I just uh, added some fluff about uh, Bitcoin and, and passwords. Um, right, so um, motivation. Uh, Pretty obvious, password leaks have been happening um, more and more. They've gotten more press coverage. Um, Adobe actually got fined by the UK Information Commissioner. It wasn't a huge fine, it was 250,000 um, pounds. But uh, it was, it was uh, nice to see there was actually a fine for having leaked all these passwords. Um, right, so basically companies have uh, proven that they can't protect their password databases against SQL injection and various other attacks. Um, what happens when companies have their password database leaked? Um, so I spent most of my PhD looking at password statistics, figuring out exactly how hard it is to guess passwords. So if a password database leaks, you have the hash, you can uh, offline do as many guesses as you want. Um, so how to read this uh, graph here. Um, the blue and the black line there are two password distributions, the famous uh, Rocky distribution from 2009, which was leaked uh, from Rocky, a gaming company. And then Yahoo is actually not the Yahoo password leak that was in the news, but some data I collected while I was an intern at Yahoo. Um, so the x-axis here is uh, what percent of uh, users in the database the attacker is going to compromise, and the y-axis is how much work they're going to do in bits. Um, so, you know, basically uh, they need a, a dictionary of that size to break that portion of users. Um, and you can see, so this only goes up to about half uh, for some statistical reasons, but the median user um, at the halfway point is only at about 20 bits. So with about a million guesses per account, that's enough to break uh, half of the password hashes you would get in any, uh, any leak. Um, so that's really low. Even if you salt, it's, it's pretty easy to throw a million guesses per, uh, per line in a salted hash file. Um, and there's some comparison to various other systems here. Unfortunately, uh, other things, pins, answers to personal knowledge questions are even, even lower. So it sort of looks like this is the, the best human memory can do, and it's, it's not very good. I think everybody knows intuitively passwords aren't very good, but when you see the statistics staring you in the face, it's uh, you know, pretty stark. Um, so I mean, the observation I had here is that 20 bits, that's only a six-digit number. And people memorize phone numbers all the time. Um, well, maybe not all the time anymore. They used to memorize. Uh, a lot of phone numbers, and we haven't had a, a large-scale evolution of this species uh, since then. In fact, it's a lot of the same people walking around who used to memorize phone numbers. Um, now, apparently, can't memorize the same amount of information for, for passwords. So something seemed wrong here. It seemed impossible to think that um, people couldn't memorize better passwords than this. So I've been thinking for a while, what would it take um, if we could even replace users' passwords with just six random digits that were actually assigned to them, we would be improving security for half of users. Um, so I you know, I've been, been, was thinking for a long time, what are the obstacles to doing that? Um, so I'm going to take a quick detour right now um, and disclaim that uh, this really shouldn't be a problem that we have to worry about. Passwords shouldn't leak. Um, the reason passwords leak is because uh, we most systems store the hashes in a pretty easily accessible way. So the standard um, formulation is that uh, you have a login server, you have a database, you have usernames and hashes. Hopefully they're salted. Hopefully the hash is iterated. In a perfect world, it might even be S-crypt. But like I said, all those things aren't really enough to protect against how weak most passwords are. Um, 
So a better setup that I wish more places did um, is to put the password database behind an HSM somewhere in some kind of secure storage that uh, isn't in a production SQL server that's likely to be leaked. Um, and then, of course, you just call the uh, HSM as a black box and ask if the password is right. Um, people don't, I mean, most websites kind of balk at this. It sounds like the, they have a lot of users. They don't want to put all of that in an HSM. Um, there's an even easier solution, which is that you just put a key into an HSM, um, make sure that that key can't easily leak, and then, looks like I had a little bit of a wrap issue on the diagram there, but um, instead of storing hashes, you just store max with some key that you protect. So if you can keep the key in hardware somewhere in your, uh, in your data center, just, you know, it's, maybe you're willing to live with it if somebody physically breaks into your data center and walks away with it, but just keep the key from leaking through SQL, then we wouldn't have this problem. Password databases wouldn't leak in, a, in an accessible form. So that's my, uh, if, if the world was uh, perfect, this, this wouldn't be such a big problem. Um, right. Uh, but, you know, even if that happened, even if websites um, got more serious about uh, storing passwords in a way that they couldn't be leaked. Um, and by the way, there's a little bit of evidence that people are thinking more about that. There's one or two startups that offer a product along those lines where they have an HSM that will do password hashing or password macking with a key that isn't uh, accessible to software. Um, you know, that, in, in reality, if websites do go in that direction, it's, you know, still years away. Um, but even if that happened, there's still a bunch of scenarios where um, we'd like to be able to memorize a strong password and, uh, you know, it, it can't be kept in hardware. So password managers, um, passphrases for a PGP private key, um, and various enterprise systems, uh, it might make sense to memorize a strong password. Um, the analogy is basically you have a lot of uh, eggs in that basket, so uh, we'd like to have a pretty strong basket. All right, so um, as my title said, our goal is going to be get to storing, uh, the goal is going to be storing 56-bit passwords in human memory. How do we go about doing that? Um, so if you think of brains as being like hard disks, uh, you um, are inevitably going to have failure. Um, so if the goal is to just write something into human memory and then a while later fetch it, um, that's very likely to fail. In fact, the amount of data that you can write in you know, a one-shot pass um, is very, very low. I probably, you know, even if I gave you a four-digit PIN number randomly and I said it once right now, you wouldn't remember it tomorrow. Um, unless you wrote it down or you, uh, it's, it's possible, but in all likelihood you would forget. So, you know, the amount of data that you can write in, in one shot is, is tiny in human memory. So we've kind of known that for a while. There's a bunch of aphorisms. This is probably the most uh, famous one that just says humans are incapable of storing uh, crypto keys and they have all these other problems. Um, the, uh, you know, I think going into this, um, yeah, if you've never seen this quote, it's, it's a pretty good one. Um, I think intuitively this is how security people sort of view the problem, that humans just can't do this. Human memory and crypto keys are uh, incompatible, so we should um, just forget about it. But we really just need a better model for how human memory works. Um, so you can't write all at once. You have to uh, gradually erode the data into human memory, just like the way um, you know, waves erode a coastline. So the picture we actually want is that you write, and then you have to write a whole bunch more times. And then eventually when you read, uh, it should succeed if you've written it enough times. So this isn't, uh, you know, shouldn't be too surprising. The more times you're told something, the more likely you are to remember it. Um, Turns out there's actually a lot of uh, psychology literature about this. This is well known. It has a scientific name and all that. Um, this is my main man, Hermann Ebbinghaus. Um, he is credited for discovering this. Um, you know, he discovered it a long time ago because when he was doing his PhD, it was interrupted because he was drafted to fight in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, but he returned successfully. Um, and he studied memory for like 30 years and produced a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, 
including he looked at uh, the rate of how you forget information. And he found this really interesting um, effect that uh, you know, when you're, uh, you learn some information, you slowly forget it. And then if you're reminded of it again, the rate at which you forget it is a much shallower curve. And the more times you've learned it, the rate at which you forget it uh, gets shallower and shallower. So he called this the forgetting curve, um, which uh, years later um, sort of morphed into uh, the learning curve, which is basically just the same thing uh, reversed, even though he actually never said the learning curve and there's some slight technical differences. Um, basically, this is where the, the learning curve in common parlance comes from. Um, so this is a really long time ago that he figured this out. There have been a load of other papers since then that have explored the same phenomenon. Basically, every variation of um, how should we space out the, tri the, the rehearsals where you learn the information? Is it better to have them evenly spaced or exponentially spaced? Uh, all that kind of stuff has been basically studied to death by the psychology, uh, by, by psychologists. Um, Mostly it's pretty small order effects. If you do space repetition at all, you get really good results and people uh, can remember a lot. And if you do the opposite, which is mass presentation or cramming, where you just tell everybody something at once over and over again in a short period of time, that doesn't work. Um, and the other evidence I'd give you that uh, this really works, um, there's a bunch of software now, SuperMemo being the most famous package that's been around for a long time. There's been a lot of versions of SuperMemo. Um, and among other communities, the group that's really into using SuperMemo are med students who have to memorize all of the bones and the veins and everything else in the body. So if you poke around uh, forums that med students go to, you can find out all the information about SuperMemo and its competitors. Also, all the information about memory-enhancing drugs, um, which I won't talk about further, but those are the two things that they seem to know a lot about or how to memorize uh, stuff. Um, and you know, if you, if you go to the SuperMemo website or any of its competitors, they'll throw a lot of scientific, uh, or I guess sort of pseudoscientific claims about how incredible it is, but basically it just does uh, timed repetition of the information, so it will sort of interrupt what you're doing and say, oh, it's time to remember what, uh, I don't know, the femoral artery is and does again. So, right, I, I really trust med students to know uh, how to memorize stuff. All right, so how can we apply this to passwords? Um, the simplest way is just every time you log in, that's gonna be a rehearsal for the password that you're trying to, to learn. So we'll start with a really basic username password prompt. And then after the user has actually typed in their password correctly, um, we'll show them some extra information. We'll just say, type what you see. Simple enough. Um, doesn't have to be words. We could also show them uh, letters. So for our experiment, we did both. Um, <clears throat> but that's the basic idea, is that you, you do a totally normal username and password login, and then you have to type a little bit extra. So after the first time that you do this, there's a delay before the hint uh, comes up of what you're supposed to type. Um, and the delay is gonna get longer and longer, but we told the users that if you can remember from the last time what your uh, extra information is, your security code, you can just type it and skip the delay. So eventually we noticed that users would start typing from memory without needing the hint, and then we'd say, aha, great, they've memorized it. Uh, and the response was to give them more information um, and slowly build up a strong password this way. So um, we still have our uh, experiment online so you can log in and see it. It's a really simple interface. The goal of this wasn't to really have a, an optimized or production ready thing, but just something that we could uh, test out. Yeah. So what's the time duration between uh, one um, so it wasn't a time variation, it was, oh, sorry, the question was, uh, what was the time variation between adding, going from one to two to three blocks? Um, so that was actually based on how quickly the users were learning. So when we detected that they learned block one, then we added block two. So on average for normal people, how long did it take to go from block one to block two? So the question was, how long did it take? Uh, I'll have a, a graph of that in a few slides. Um, 
Anyway, yes, so experiment.research.microsoft.com. Apparently, this was the first time Microsoft Research ever ran an experiment, so we <laughs> got that URL. Easy to remember. Um, so you can try it out, but it's, uh, it's not that sophisticated. Um, the goal, in fact, was to have it be really simple and just say space repetition works. You don't have to think about it that much. All right, so digression two. Um, Given the claim that we can get users to memorize a pretty, uh, pretty strong random password, how big do we want it to be? So I think a really cool way to answer this question now is with Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is basically a giant project to pay people to do brute force. So we can use that as a, a proxy of basically how much a lot of brute force costs. So you can go online, you can get graphs of basically how much revenue miners are making. Um, so that's like $3 million a day is about what the miners have been uh, pulling in in 2014. So, you know, pretty good money. This is a serious industrial effort. Um, and on the right there, that shows uh, the hash rate. So how many hashes per second, and it's in the like 2 to the 50 per second. So just a crazy number. Um, so in the paper, we have the numbers from 2013. Which, it, which is that the miners did about uh, 2 to the 75 uh, SHA-256s, and that earned them about $250 million. So if you multiply it out, $8 billion to do a 2 to the 80 search in a year. Pretty expensive. Um, of course, uh, six months later, if we just look at the first six months of uh, 2014, um, they've now done 2 to the 80 work in half a year, so like real exponential growth still going on. Um, for only a little bit uh, more in earnings. Um, so this is, you know, it's pretty approximate. If you were, say, a large intelligence agency, you could probably be more efficient than Bitcoin miners, a lot of whom have, you know, jumped into the gold rush aspect of this. Um, but as a rough approximation, uh, we'd estimate today that doing 2 to the 70, that's sort of in the million dollar range, and 2 to the 80 is probably more in the billion dollar range. So how do we get to two, uh, 2 to the 56? Well, you can do some stretching. Um, stretching is your friend. You just iterate the hash when you're uh, you know, unlocking your PGP private key or logging a user in. Um, so a safe assumption is that if you're doing uh, you know, like web or remote login in an enterprise scenario, you can stretch with about 2 to the 14. Again, that's a pretty rough estimate, but it's, it's reasonable. That's like you know, still in the range of milliseconds. Um, and if you're unlocking your private key, 2 to the 24, you can easily do that in less than a second on your laptop, so that's pretty safe, and that can get you from 2 to the 56 up to 2 to the 80. Um, so it, you know, we sort of, maybe because that's a classic number, 56 bits from Des Keys, that, that's why we honed in on it, but it's a reasonable amount with stretching that can get you into pretty expensive uh, attacks. Okay, so if 56 bits is good, how do we represent it? Obviously, there's a bunch of different choices. Um, the, uh, you know, the, basically, you can either do some sort of random characters from a different alphabet, uh, or you can do random words from a word list. There's a bunch of word lists out there. We ended up making our own for the experiment, um, which I'll show you in a second. Um, the diceware list is maybe the most popular. If you actually dig into it, it's got a lot of random stuff on there, like klaxon. Um, if, you, yeah, if you generate four diceware words, uh, you, you're likely to get at least one thing that's pretty weird. So we went with smaller list, a few more words um, for the experiment. So uh, again, our goal wasn't really to optimize, um, but we did have two experimental conditions, which were people memorizing uh, 12 random letters versus six uh, short words. And our word list, um, which you know, feel free to use if you want to use for another purpose. Um, but we kind of just hacked this together. We wanted one that was, uh, well, we wanted to have exactly the same level of security as for the random characters. So the word list is 676 words, which is 26 squared. Um, and we filtered out, uh, we were told for ethical reasons we should filter out like swear words and negative words and stuff like that. So, you know, you uh, making word lists for this purpose is still kind of a dark art. I think it would be cool if there actually was a standard optimized word list. Um, we just went for really common short English words. All right, so putting our thing to the test. 
Of course, we use uh, Mechanical Turk, um, go to stop for any kind of online tests now. Um, we offered people $19 because we wanted them to do a two week study where they would log in over and over again. Um, we didn't tell them that it was about security. We had an elaborate cover story about how we were studying attention and wakefulness throughout the day. Uh, and um, we asked that they do 90 sessions in two weeks. The reason we went for a pretty high number is because we weren't sure um, basically how quickly they would learn and we wanted to make sure that we overshot. Uh, so that was the deal. Um, pretty, standard, uh, pretty standard stuff. Um, like I said, uh, basically 60 second task. Um, you have, they, we gave them two weeks. They had to wait at least 30 minutes between trials. That's important for the spacing that, there's like, uh, that they couldn't do them all at once. And we paid them about $20. Um, and it was basically just that interface I showed you earlier. After they successfully logged in, this is just the cover story. We asked them how long it had been since they slept, if they'd had caffeine, stuff like that. And then we had them play a game which measured their reaction time, um, which you can play online at experiment.research.microsoft.com. Um, pretty simple game. It just had the words left or right appear in the left or right side of the screen. And you had to hit a key based on the word and not the side that it appeared on as fast as you can, um, which is really simple, but it's also like infuriatingly hard. And when you try to go fast, you make, make mistakes. So um, we just wanted something fun that would distract people and be sort of plausible. And it seemed like people liked it. Right. Um, so we were trying to be like unobtrusive about the fact that this was a really a security study. So we you know, gave them a little bit of blather about uh, concern about people stealing accounts to get bonuses. So we said, we're adding an extra security code. Please type it. Um, when they typed it, we said, uh, you know, congrats. You've learned it. We're adding more. And eventually, they got up to the having three codes. And if they successfully memorized the third code, we didn't add any more. So we were just getting to 56 bits and didn't go any beyond that. But you know, basically, the only thing that we told them about security in the whole experiment was these three yellow pop-up boxes at the right uh, moment. And there was like a, a help menu, but very few people went to look for it. In general, people got the interface like, without, without many issues. Um, and of course, after they did it, we insisted that they wait 30 minutes before trying it again. So like I said, most users got it. Um, we had some dropouts, but most of the dropouts were after like two or three games, people seem to just not like it and not come back. People who survived the third game, um, the uh, survival rate to the end was, uh, was pretty high. 75% um, and we did do a control where they didn't have the extra words and it was 85%. So not statistically significant, maybe people were a little bit more likely to drop out when we were making them do the extra, extra words. Um, so of the people who actually hung in until the end, um, almost all of them ended up memorizing the whole code. So that was really nice to see. Um, of the people who didn't memorize it, uh, four people never even got to the second code, which was kind of confusing. Um, but in the follow-up, they all told us the same thing, which was basically, I memorized this code, and then you gave me another one. I don't want to play that game. I'm out. <laughs> And they were willing to just wait. The delay got a half a second longer every trial. So at the end, they were willing to wait 45 seconds on every login to just not be threatened to have to memorize anything more. Um, yeah, I mean, if you ever do a Mechanical Turk study, it's amazing how much people type and how just brutally honest they are. Um, so we had some other good ones where people complained about various things. But uh, I like this guy who said, are you, I mean, are you serious? If there are people that fell for that, Please do not tell me, as I would be very disappointed and fearful for the future of humanity. <laughs> um, so in our paper, we called these, uh, these four people the conscientious objectors, because they figured out what they thought was going on and just said, I, I refuse to participate. <laughs> what? No, these are four different people. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so as was asked earlier, how long did it take people to memorize the chunks? Um, so this uh, basically shows after each uh, you know, login attempt how far people were along. Um, 
The solid line is people who are memorizing words, and the dashed line is letters, so you can see not a huge difference. The words were a little bit faster learners. Um, and, uh, you know, not too long. By about the 30th uh, login, I think more than half of people had the whole thing. And by like 40 or 50, it was way up in the 90% range, had the whole thing. Um, you know, one concern we had was, would it be harder for people to learn the third code once they'd already learned two? So if we slide that graph and just look at the time since you first saw that piece of the code, how long it took you to memorize it, um, that effect didn't happen. So people actually learned the second and third component faster than they learned the first one. The blue here is the first one, and you can see it took a little bit longer for them to memorize the first component than the other ones. Um, probably just because people were used to the interface by the second and third ones, so it was easy for them to, to, uh, to memorize it. Um, right, so the million dollar question, of course, they were able to do it in a study, what would happen uh, afterward? So three days after the whole thing was finished, we invited people back, at which point we debriefed. We said this was really a security study. Um, we asked them to type the code if they remembered it. We said if you wrote it down, please don't write it from, uh, please don't enter it from what you wrote down. Try to do it from memory. Um, okay, so uh, like I said, um, most people who finished the study got the whole code, and of the people who got the whole code, almost all of them, 99% memorized it. So in the first follow-up, after three days, um, pretty good. Between 80 and 90% uh, were able to, to recall it from memory after three days. And that was after a minimum of three days. The median time was actually about four and a half days, because people had to check their email and actually show up for the, the debriefing. Um, and for some people, it was longer because they finished before the, the, the two weeks as well. Um, so that was pretty promising. We had this random group of people, and we got about 90% of them to have memorized a 56-bit secret. Um, we did ask them to come back uh, 17 days later because we wanted to test recall uh, further into time. Um, and we dropped down to like the 50-60% range, which is kind of what we expected. Um, since they hadn't seen it in two weeks at that point, and there was only two weeks of training. Um, the, uh, you know, you could view this sort of glass half full or glass half empty. It was cool that we got anybody to memorize it, you know, two weeks later, and it actually was still a majority of people. Um, but it also shows that if you were going to deploy something like this, if people go on a two-week vacation, you might be in trouble. So, you know, you, it might be different if they've been using it for a year. They'd be a lot more likely to memorize it from, through two weeks of disuse. Um, but at least through the first, you know, more than two weeks, people will need to keep uh, rehearsing. Okay, so of the people who didn't recall it, um, you know, how many of these were typos versus people actually not remembering it? Uh, unfortunately, most of it was that people genuinely didn't remember it. Um, you know, we could split the, the errors into a few categories. Um, about 10% of people just rearranged the order of... Uh, of different components, so that was good. Those people you could fix with only like a few bits of security lost if you're willing to accept the components out of order. Um, a pretty small number of people had like a one character typo. I think it was only two out of like 80 people. So basically like typo correction, which we were excited about and we thought would be an advantage of words. We chose the word list so that, you know, the words were all at a distance three away so that we could fix typos. Um, that didn't matter. People had almost no typos. And the majority of people were, like, forgot significant portions of the code where we, we couldn't fix it without really dragging security down into the, you know, unacceptable range. Um, how much delay did this impose? It wasn't too bad, actually. Um, the median was about seven seconds per login. It was significantly less for people who were typing words or significantly less for people who are typing letters than typing words. Makes sense, they had a lot less to type. Um, and the total over two weeks, the total amount of training time uh, that we had per user, the median was about 12 minutes. Um, so that was the uh, total of all these small delays on each login, and that was enough for the, the 56 bits. Um, another question uh, we were worried about is if people would just write these down. Um, and the, about 20% of people wrote the codes down. 
Um, so not like a negligible percentage of people wrote the codes down. Um, but the cool thing was that the people who wrote the codes down, they actually had worse recall in the follow-up study than the people who didn't write it down, which makes sense since they were just typing off a of code the whole time and never from memory. And we asked them, please don't write off of the, please don't try to recall off of the thing you wrote down, try to get it out of your memory. Um, it was actually harder for them to do that. So the fact that people wrote it down actually made our results worse. Um, so two pretty interesting points of comparison. There's another password paper. There's actually seven password papers at Usenix this year. So if anybody's going to Usenix, there's going to be like multiple whole sessions about passwords, which is uh, crazy, especially as someone who like a year ago, I think, tweeted and blogged that password research was dead and people should not get into it because I thought we'd done all the interesting stuff. Um, anyway, so uh, paper out of uh, CMU by Saranga Kalmanduri. Um, they looked at uh, different password policies. Um, they let people choose their own password. And then um, they told people, choose a password you've never used before. They came back two to five days later. And the recall they got was about 75%. Um, so again, compare that to uh, more like 90% uh, with spaced repetition. Um, the cool thing there is that like, you'd think users being able to choose their own passwords would be much more memorable than randomly chosen passwords. Um, space repetition actually like, blows that effect out of the water. And when I was writing the paper, I went to, to look for related work and look for studies where they actually compared um, user chosen versus assigned passwords head to head and looked at recall. I found four papers that did this. And a funny thing happened. Every single one of them said, um, we weren't able to show with statistical significance that the user chosen passwords were actually more memorable than the randomly chosen passwords. Um, and every paper individually thought that this was just uh, their sample size wasn't big enough. Um, but you know, by the time you put all these papers together, you start to realize that users being able to choose a password doesn't actually make it very much more memorable. Um, it's really the lack of training that's the problem for memory. Um, so I guess to conclude, I would just say um, there still are some papers that might be worth doing this level of training for. Um, certainly in an enterprise environment, you know, one of the motivations doing this from Microsoft uh, was they want something that their employees and uh, employees who buy their software could use to memorize a stronger password at work. Um, and you know, I'd, the I guess I'd encourage people to steer away from the doom and gloom of like humans are incapable of stuff and try to look at what humans actually can do and design a password system that works for people. Um, and I think, you know, based on our finding, the way that the rough outline of that, um, you have to accept that there's going to be a training period where security is lower. People can't memorize the random password right away, so you have to have it stored in memory so that you can give it to them as hints. Um, you know, during the training period, you can use either a user chosen password that they already know, or maybe email or some more complicated authentication mechanism while you train them. And then once you've trained them, you can switch over to high security mode. Um, so the notion that we have to switch, like immediately when a user enrolls, they have to already have a really strong password forever, um, that's something we should move away from to, you know, security is something that ramps up over time as they memorize the strong password. Um, there's probably some, uh, a lot of follow-up work to, to do to optimize this. How long should the um, code be? What's the right format? Should we um, do targeted rehearsals where instead of just waiting for the user to show up and log in, we actually prompt them actively somehow? Um, can we do this on other formats, touchscreen, not just password, but swipe patterns, stuff like that? So, you know, we've uh, pretty openly left a lot on the table in terms of optimizing this to a usable system. And there's a lot of other memory effects out there. So, you know, reading the psychology literature about memory, looking into space repetition, there's tons of other named effects um, that, you know, uh, that we know about that haven't really been applied to passwords yet. So should be some interesting research testing out uh, if we can, we can use those. Um, and then you can get, you know, if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, you can get into the realm of memory athletics, um, which is 
kind of blown up in the last five to ten years and they now have big championships. There are professional memory athletes who do this as a full-time job. Um, they held the first ever Canadian memory championship in 2012. That was your winner. Um, and it's grown, I think, like the, the first year that they did it, the grand prize was $50. And um, now uh, Angel Yuan Man Lai is like a professional. That's all she does is do memory competitions, and she's able to sustain herself. Um, so you know, if you want to burn some time, you can go on YouTube and see these people memorize like four randomly shuffled decks of cards in 10 minutes, and other things that just seem unimaginably hard. Um, and they, they use memory palaces and all like really cool, amazing stuff that you can read about. Probably we won't get to that level. Uh, you know, I hope we're not bringing that to bear for passwords. It's probably a little too heavyweight. Um, but it is fun stuff. There's a lot more uh, to, to explore in terms of memory. Um, so besides me and Stuart, uh, a lot of other people helped with the research. And like I said, you can try it uh, yourself, the experiments online, and I should have time for uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed that you had person who tried to memorize one password. What happens when uh, you have many websites passing into Google? So how do you not get muddled between which one belongs to one? Right. So the, the question was um, we just did this for uh, one login. What will happen when users are trying to do it for multiple uh, places at once? So that's definitely a problem. Um, it's called interference. Uh, there have been a lot of studies, a lot of psychology studies on interference. It, probably only one or two studies on interference with passwords. Um, like I said at the beginning, most systems should not be using spaced repetition. They should probably not be using passwords at all. And if they are, they probably don't need strong enough passwords that this comes into play. Um, I'd say, yeah, that's follow-up work to see. It's probably not practical to say humans would only need one strong password. It would be great if we got to that goal. Um, the from my reading of the literature, if people have to do this with a couple, like two or three or four, the space repetition will like blow interference away. So like humans are definitely capable of doing it. Um, that being said, we part of the mess on the web now is that users are memorizing more like 50 to 100 passwords, and that probably won't work. So I guess the answer is like scaling the number of passwords people are asked to memorize down to just a handful. Yeah. Um, you're saying tired yourself, but won't the fact that I've heard this talk affect my performance? So, I'm sorry, the question is... You're, you're saying to us, we should go and try. Yeah. But we've heard the talk. Ah, right. So, so the, won't that affect... Right, so you're saying the won't having heard the talk affect uh, your experience here. Um, I mean, it won't cause space repetition not to work unless your neurons have like a vastly different structure than everybody else's. Um, the, uh, well, I when can I, imagine one of us trying to make it not work. Oh, well, if you really don't want to memorize something, you definitely won't memorize it. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying, like, I guess when I said try it yourself, I mostly meant, you know, you could try it a few times and see how the interface looks. If you want to log in 90 times in two weeks, you're welcome to do that. Um, we're not going to pay you $20 or <laughs> add your data into the study. So um, honestly, I'd say, actually, like, if you do want to try this, what I do for my personal passwords, um, I, you know, randomly generate them using some shell script, and then I write them down on a post-it note in my wallet. Um, like, you know, once a year if I actually pick a new password for my, uh, just, I guess I just use, like, let's see. I don't want to give away my personal uh, security pattern here, but I probably have, like, one for my webmail, one for my finance websites, and one for my, uh, my OS. And about a year or so I try to rev them. I write it down on a Post-it note in my wallet. Um, I do, like, 60 bits. I don't memorize it all at once, but after a few days, the like, cost of pulling it out of your wallet is so annoying that I'll stop doing it, and I'll type it from memory and be fine. And you can, you know, you can definitely do that experiment on yourself if you want to try. And I, I think you'll be really surprised at how well it works. 
Um, the, of course, you're carrying a, a password around in your wallet, which some experts say is a no-no. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, if your wallet gets stolen, you have a lot of problems. So, uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, just two quick questions. So I think what I'm hearing from you is if you were to have this, then the normal pulses like pass password expiration after 30 days or are no longer required. Is that still correct? Or um, if you were to do password expirations, and then I can make sure that you show me it takes about 30 days to learn that, that's roughly around when your password will expire again. Yeah. Yeah, so this would, that's a, so the question was how would this work in conjunction with like a 30 day password expiry policy? Probably not very well. There aren't that many places that are still doing 30 day password expiry. That's pretty aggressive. Um, Every single company that I work for has almost had something. Said 30 days. Yeah. Wow. What? Wow. So I guess a few companies are still doing 30 days. Yeah. That wouldn't work. I mean, most of the... And it says that it should not be the same as the last password, right? There yeah. Some, some... So there are a couple papers like saying that password expiration policies don't work, that users like choose the next password in a pretty predictable way. Of course, the danger is that if we tell people, ah, you can get users to memorize random passwords, then all of a sudden password expiry policies do work because they will have a totally different password every 30 days. But yeah, that... Well, that's fine. So uh, the second question I have was, I think the participant list that you have, it's, it's a pretty small set, and you're trying to project that to a much larger population. Right. And I'm sure you don't even know the, the actual people to sit behind the mechanical kind of curve interface, if they're young kids, if they're older people, whatever, or what's the distribution? Right? right. Yeah, so there's, there's a, a stack of papers now um, looking at the population of people. The, the question was, what do we know about the, the population that did this experiment and how it projects to the general population? Um, there was actually a paper at Soups last week about the Mechanical Turk population, uh, like from specifically from the computer security perspective. In addition to, like, psychologists are all over Mechanical Turk, and they've written a lot of meta studies about who does Mechanical Turk experiments and how are they different from the population. The, Generally, they're like they're not they're not a, a random sample from the population, but they're better than almost anything else you can get in an experiment. They are like a little bit younger and more tech savvy, which you know, of course, we put in the paper as a limitation. Um, yeah, it's possible that with different people we would get worse results, but the. I think I'm, I'm not just curious about the age uh, differences, but also professions, for example. Right. What type of profession they're in. So based on those things, I think even within the same age group, you would have diversities. Right. Yeah, so. Your example, starting with medical students being able to remember a lot more, is a very good example of what in support of this, that medical students would be able to learn this much faster. Right, so yeah, the question was like not just age, but differences between different people in different occupations. I mean, I could always say like, that's a great follow-up study. We should look at it and collect more. We didn't collect any PII, like no demographics, nothing. Um, so, you know, we could certainly redo it and look for those effects in, like I said, there's at least 100 psychology papers about spaced repetition, and it's, it's always been robust from you know, like three-year-olds on up to the rest of, of life. Um, so my gut feeling is that it should be pretty okay, but yeah, certainly like you can't say with certainty without studying it, so uh, yeah. So um, I have this idea that um, I didn't see in the future work, so I was wondering maybe some studies. Um, instead of picking four random words, um, we pick the first one from the list of nouns, the second one verb, uh, transitive verbs, the third one adjectives, and the fourth one nouns, so you get like uh, set, sort of like a sentence. Right. I think it could be still equally random, but you would guess that, that you might be able to form a mental picture around like you know, buffaloes, punch, spinning, boulders, something like that. Right. Yeah, maybe that would help. So uh, we actually are, so, uh, oh, the question was, what about instead of memorizing a random set of words, if we make it a random sentence, or try to have some meaning, some structure, and mix of nouns and verbs? Um, I think that, that that should definitely help. Uh, we actually are doing that as a follow-up study. Um, we're looking at a few different formulations to try to optimize. Um, and there have been other password studies that have done this in the context of like 
I guess, non-masked presentation, and they've always found that like uh, the random password didn't do any better than the random strings of characters and been puzzled by it. I would say the reason is that without repetition, like people just can't memorize anything. Um, but I think, yeah, within repetition, I think it'll help. I think the effect will be small, but yeah, we're actually like, should be launching that on MTurk in a couple weeks. So uh, should have some answers for you in whatever the next paper is. Yeah. So uh, to go back to your first question, like the have too many passwords. Like, do you think it's a uh, place for like say password managers or something where you're like, okay, we want to read secure password from a password manager, and then everything else can be okay? Yeah. So, I mean, that was somewhere. That was one of our key applications was password managers. That was the question was is password managers a way around the the multiple passwords problem? Yeah. I mean, password managers are are good. I think the there's still a bunch of usability problems with them. Well, there's a bunch of security problems. There have been two pretty good papers in the last year on security holes in password managers that are, uh, one was on mobile and one was on like web-based password managers that most of them are like really shoddily made, uh, have like simple coding errors, but that can be fixed. Um, the problem like, there's a few core usability challenges like websites don't have a standard way so sometimes they don't know where to fill the thing in um, installing them on different devices and syncing and stuff like that we've never really come up with the right model for but yeah I mean in theory I think password manager and the ultimately like the sort of end game of password managers is that you just have your one device that you can locally authenticate to and then it does strong, you know, like certificate-based authentication to everywhere else you want to go. That's like the ultimate password manager, and you know, hopefully in 10, 15 years we get some approximation of that. I'm, you know, you laugh, but I, I'd be surprised if we get there much sooner than than that. Yeah. Um, about 30 years ago. MCI Mirror. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to. MCI Mirror. MCI. MCI Mirror. Okay. This was um, one of the first commercial email systems outside the internet. I mean, okay. MCI Mirror. Mm -hmm. So. Was the head hand children. And I remember getting my father email so he could communicate with me. And they generated, they gave you the password. They wouldn't allow you to make it. So my father was having trouble remembering the password, but he finally remembered it. But I got into a discussion with um, Vint about this. Um, I remember what it was. It was these were random sequences of letters. Mm -hmm. About 10, 12 letters. But either they had done it with software or a human had vetted them to make sure that while they were random, they were pronounceable. Right. And then, so the, the only one they actually gave out were the pronounceable one. So, I found that I ended up remembering my father's password just because the first time I saw it, I found that I could read it. Mm. And it sounded funny, but that funniness made it stick in my mind. And Okay, I don't remember it now, but it took me, I mean, for, for 10 years after that, any time I uh, 
for some funny that word came to my mind. That mm. sequence came to my mind. So yes. Uh, so the question was about uh, pronounceable passwords. Um, uh, and how, like, if they're funny, then it helps it come to mind. So, yeah, the, those are... Unpronounceable. Pronounceable, right. Yeah, so... I mean, that's the, 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 the key. So there's actually... It's random. Right. But the fact that I could say it... Yeah, so there's actually, like, in 1993, I think, NIST came out with a standard for pronounceable passwords that has a few issues with it, but, um, you know, like, pronounceable passwords have been been around for a while. I think they're like, they're a good idea. Um, although I guess kind of like our results showed where we, there was very small difference between random letters or words. Pronounceable passwords will help a little bit, but you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record. Like training is the dimension that matters. Pronounceability or words versus letters are, that's a small change. Training is a big change. So it's definitely like something we could look at in probably future work as if pronounceable makes a big difference. And I'm sure like pronounceable will be better than not pronounceable. But probably it sounds like in your story, in addition to being pronounceable, it took your dad a while to memorize it and there were a lot of repetitions and maybe you heard it multiple times. Yeah. But yeah, pronounceable is good. So can you go to the slide, I think a couple forward from here. Uh, yeah. Can you talk more about these three effects? Uh, sure. So the generation effect, um, the examples, like if you're trying to get people to memorize, uh, say, colors, instead of actually saying, like, red, you say, um, like, roses are blank, and then have them fill in red. And... Uh, They've done you know, exactly that formulation, and the, the user population that has to fill in the blank does way better than the one that's just given the word. Um, and it has to do with the fact that you're doing like basically a fetch into memory to think of red, and that makes the, the association stronger. So that's generation effect. If you like, have to actively recall in the very first training, that helps. Um, depth of processing is how much you have to actually engage with it. So uh, if you have to say something out loud, or if you have to write it by hand, or paint it, um, or any like, in fact, like the more uh, large muscular motions you have to make, it makes the thing more memorable. So if you had to do like an interpretive dance for each <laughs> thing you're trying to memorize, that would be the best. Um, but basically like the more, the more parts of your brain have to think about the thing, the more memorable it's going to be. Um, so in a sense, we had some, because they saw it, and then they had to actually type it back. That's much better than just showing it to them. If they had to type it, and then say it, and then sing it, that would be even better. That's depth of processing. And dual coding or multi-coding, um, if you can represent the same information in multiple ways, then it's much more memorable. Um, Yes, and also there are there have been some passwords papers that have looked at this where you have like a sequence of words and you also have images with the words. We were actually going to do that in this study and then there was some issue we weren't sh some issue with the, the ethics people about just like using random images off of uh, Google Images, so we're hopefully going to do that in the next iteration, see like how much better people do if we give them the words and also show them pictures of the words. So that's, that's dual coding. And there's others too, but these are, I thought, the, the coolest ones that are the most readily accessible. Yeah. Uh, speaking of ethics, did you have to submit your word list to the ethics people to make sure there wasn't any bad words? There? Uh, do we did, do yeah, we, we like stapled it to the... Um, to the application. Uh, sorry, the question was, did we have to submit our word list to the ethics board? And yeah, it was, you know, it was stapled there along with a bunch of other experimental design stuff. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it would be bad if the words were like explicitly objectionable or, or whatever, but we just got rid of the... That, I assume was there an objection to showing random images that there might be something? Like, is that, that yeah, be so... You know, like, I mean, I could go back to the word list. Some of them, um, 
it's possible some of them would get you something on Google Images that might be scary. I don't know, like Agony was on there, so maybe you don't want to show people random images from whatever Agony gives you. Um, but we can do it, you just like, they have to all be hand vetted, so. I imagine adults would abuse. What? You have adult and abuse. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad if, adult would actually probably be the worst one. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so I can speak right now.